Cyberpunk is a really weird game for me. As you saw with the title, Cyberpunk manages to be really fun and entertaining, while simultaneously having a lot of average at best gameplay mechanics. Everyone knows about the horrible launch that the game had. I'm sure it'll come up in this video, but I'm not here to dwell on that. While most of the bugs and glitches have been fixed on current gen consoles and PC, being stuck in that development hell cycle for so long clearly had a negative effect on the in-game content and not just how the game runs. A lot of what was advertised just isn't there in the final product, or what is there turned out to be kinda lackluster. This development hell cycle that Cyberpunk was stuck in has also left some noticeable continuity errors in dialogue and missions. Now, I'm not making this video as a late to the party hit piece to bash Cyberpunk and CD Projekt Red. It's actually quite the opposite. I had a lot of fun with Cyberpunk despite the noticeable issues. Honestly, this is one of my favorite games of the last 10 or so years. To explain my feelings on the situation, let's just upset most of the people watching, cause you know, that's always what you want to do a minute into a really long video. A ton of gamers spent the last year arguing about whether Elden Ring or God of War Ragnarok was the game of the year for 2022. Cyberpunk clearly didn't come out in 2022, but it wasn't playable for me until last summer, and I had more fun playing Cyberpunk than I did either Elden Ring or Ragnarok. That is my subjective opinion. I liked Cyberpunk more. Looking at it objectively and taking personal feelings out of it, no fucking way I could say that Cyberpunk is a better game than either of those two. I definitely wouldn't call Cyberpunk a bad game, but I know it's not that good either. Features promised years before release are still missing, true weapon and vehicle customization is almost non-existent, character interactions can be really repetitive, important story beats are poorly conveyed, and Night City looks amazing, but also feels kind of empty at the same time. Because of stuff like that, this was a very hard script to write. It was difficult to not be overly negative and then contradict myself by just saying, well, but I still liked it, at the end of each topic. But it is what it is. This game is far from perfect. I like to critique games and talk about both the good and the bad in my videos, even if I love the game, and Cyberpunk certainly isn't going to be that exception to the rule. There will be minor spoilers in the first half, all things that happen in the first couple hours of the game, but I'll give a legit spoiler warning before I start really getting into the plot and characters in case you haven't played it yet. First off, I want to touch on the open world and its optional content. For me, this was a massive strong suit of Cyberpunk, and I feel like this is what sucked me in when I couldn't play it release. Night City is really unique and extremely detailed. It genuinely looks like a fictional urban city, and no sections ever feel like a copy and paste of assets. The basis of its design, its building structure, road and highway layouts, shopping districts and slums, might be the best ever made. Even though the badlands and oil fields are mostly barren, I feel like that's how a desert wasteland should be in this world too. While it's not always the most exciting to explore, it feels very realistic in terms of the game's setting. The framework and design of the open world is literally amazing to look at. Night City's design is as good as any location that I've ever played. But it's pretty superficial. The city itself is very fun to run around and see all the sights, but it won't take long before you realize that you can't really do much with what you're looking at. As the game goes on, the interaction factor just isn't there. You constantly get prompts for locked doors that you can never go in that leaves you with a sinking feeling that they originally intended for those areas to be accessible. Civilians are very generic and offer absolutely nothing of note when you can talk to them. Majority of the vendors you can't even interact with and are just for show. Random encounters are dumbed down to simply being allowed to attack people when you see a yellow arrow above their head, and characters talk about hard-ass, corrupt Night City cops, but they show up at the weirdest and most inconsistent times. Even on next gen, the cops still seem to be a broken mechanic. Not to mention, since there really isn't anything to interact with in Night City, there's never really a reason for the cops to show up in the first place. Getting around Night City has been significantly improved as driving physics have gotten way better over time. My first playthrough last year was actually on a base PS4. Yeah, I played 60 hours on a base PS4, goddammit. Whenever it feels like I'm shitting on this game too much, Remember that's what I dealt with in order to keep playing. Anyway, the slightest pressure on the analog stick made it look like V got hit by an invisible tornado. If you were driving in first person view, it was almost comical to watch her hands do a complete 180 with the steering wheel when I barely touched the stick. As more updates came out, and especially with subsequent playthroughs on the PS5, I felt like I was playing an entirely different game. 
I don't know. Maybe it's all in my head, but I felt like I had so much more control on next gen and specifically after the 1.6 patch. But here's one of the cool things about Cyberpunk. Different cars don't just have different speeds. They all drive and handle differently. If you're going fast, big sedans have a horrible turning radius compared to sports cars. If you're using those sports cars and don't let off the gas while whipping around a turn, you're going to keep flying forward or spin out rather than drifting through. Cheaper sports cars don't handle as well as the more expensive ones. Driving a big bulky van or Jeep feels shaky and slow, but those are going to handle way better in the Badlands than one of those luxury cars will. On the PS4, driving was fun because of how broken it was. I actually got kind of good at making my car do somersaults. On the PS5, it's fun because it's just fun. Bombing through the streets and trying to drift through those tight corners while doing 100 is a good time. Night City is nowhere near as big as other open world maps, so you can get from corner to corner in a matter of minutes with the right cars. Because the city is so condensed, you're always engaged with driving and trying not to crash. But you will run into situations like this from time to time. You'll spend a lot of time driving while just staring at the minimap, and right now it's telling me to just keep going straight. Well, there's stuff in the road, and by trying not to run head on into it, I managed to wedge my car inside some scaffolding. Cars in Cyberpunk can take a shitload of damage before exploding, but they do get stuck on the environment really easily. I always found myself looking at the minimap about as much as I did actually watching where I was driving. I feel like the game recognizes this is going to happen a lot because they do a good job of keeping traffic from getting too condensed. Going through the streets, cars tend to give you an open lane or plenty of room to maneuver around. On highways, the game knows you're able to just follow forward more freely without looking at the map and will populate all lanes more accordingly to let you have fun weaving through the traffic. AI car speeds seem really inconsistent though. Sometimes a random car will be stopped dead in the middle of traffic, and sometimes that other traffic is keeping pace with me when I'm doing 180. It's never enough to be a problem, but it's enough to be noticeable that the game struggles with what speed its AI traffic is supposed to maintain. I always drove in third person because I just thought first person view was bad. I felt like your view was way too obstructed. The interior of the car takes up a ton of screen space and it's damn near impossible to see what's on your left or right sides. That makes almost every turn a leap of faith. If the ground isn't level, forget about it. You can't even see what's right in front of you if you're on an incline. To say I don't play many racing games is an understatement. I struggle with Mario Kart, let alone a realistic one, so maybe I'm just not used to it, but I thought the first person driving was damn near impossible unless you were only going like 25 miles an hour. Third person was way better in my opinion. Also, when you're not driving, you're going to want to get the double jump cyberware the second you have enough money. There isn't a ton of interesting stuff to explore as you climb buildings. I did manage to find this kid's drawing of a dinosaur yelling at a blue dick though, but Double Jump just makes on-foot traversal through Night City much more convenient. Despite the lack of interaction you can have with the city itself, I really liked the setting and atmosphere. It's that uniqueness and dedication to its own setting that still draws you in and makes it easy to ignore a laundry list of shortcomings and seemingly cut open world content. The open world content outside of scripted missions and side quests may be lacking, but Cyberpunk absolutely nails the aesthetic, tone, and feel of a high-tech dystopian culture. Night City has its upper class areas, it has its working class, and it has major crime areas. There's entertainment districts, some old and abandoned while others are flourishing, industrial areas, and even sections for foodies or people who are just looking to get laid. They put a very clear effort into making Night City feel like a no-morals, fictional version of a futuristic urban city. This feels like you're playing something along the lines of The Fifth Element or Blade Runner. I'm sure there's some game out there that I've missed, but I can't really remember getting these vibes from anything else that I've played. When I do play open world games, I usually hit a pretty hard wall when it comes to aimless exploration. It's fun for a while, and when I get that sinking feeling that I've seen just about everything the game has to offer, I lose all desire to explore as quick as you can snap your fingers. There needs to be something else there to keep my attention other than just looking cool. So when you add in good side content, which Cyberpunk definitely has, it really highlights the game design and unique lore of the world. In this instance, Cyberpunk is both infuriating and fun at the same time. They put so much effort into making this awesome setting, 
but it's a setting you can't really interact with. Once the shine of the bright lights and silliness of the billboards fades, you stop paying attention and it's just a place to drive around while going to different missions. I feel like there was a pretty easy fix for this too. Let's just get this rant out of the way because it was a huge gripe of mine, definitely my biggest with the entire game. All they had to do was cut down on the reliance of V's goddamn cell phone. This is a feature that drove me absolutely nuts at times. This little bastard will be going off constantly and the information you receive almost always never matters. First off, and most importantly, let's stay on the topic of how it hinders the open world exploration. What does it matter to my fixers that I can rent more apartments or buy more cars? At the start of the game, I already have a car, I already have an apartment, that should be all they're concerned with. They aren't hiring a homeless person who's working for bus money. Stop calling and texting me to tell me exactly where to go to buy more stuff that doesn't matter for the jobs they're fixing. Not to mention that if you actually go and buy any of these cars, they don't even bother to put an NPC or any kind of transaction around it. You just get in like you would any random car, but this time your money goes down. Make V explore Night City to find out things like housing and cars. You can check dozens, if not hundreds, of people's computers and read their messages throughout the entire city. Almost every location has an open laptop somewhere that you can log into and read messages on. Even though you have the option of always checking these, what's on there doesn't matter at fucking all unless a mission marker directly tells us to check them. But what if someone's computer has a tip about a shady place that's selling a stolen car? Or if V has to check her own mail and she's getting spam about new apartments? Maybe it could even be something stupid and interactive. Like if you don't rent a place for a while in game time, it gets a little cheaper. Like, shit. Something to interact with other than a text message and a map marker. Or you could go the full-on explorer's route and actually have V need to stumble upon these apartments and need to talk to the landlords about purchasing them. This is just one example that seems really easy to implement that would force the players to interact with and, most importantly, explore the world rather than just following destination markers your entire playthrough. Throughout the game, random people will call V and offer jobs. I have no clue who any of these people are, and as a result, don't care who any of these people are. If you take a break from the story missions, it makes remembering who's important to the plot and who's just a random number in V's phone kind of difficult to separate. There's too many characters' names just flying around constantly. Why not make it so you can run into fixers in the open world rather than them calling V out of nowhere? Bars are all over the place. Maybe you could hear tips by going through and interacting with NPCs there. Maybe one of those hundred vendor stalls that never matters has a fixer sitting there and eating that you can run into. Even better, what if one of those side missions you're completing isn't in the best interest of another crime boss, and that's how your paths cross? This way, if they do call for job tips later, you at least found them yourself and set up a working relationship with them because the player did something other than answering a phone call that occurs just because you drove into their territory. It's kind of contradictory to the story when this keeps happening too. They all start calling you after a failed job that got V's fixer, netrunner, and partner killed. That fixer, Dexter Deshawn, was one of the big names in the crime world too. It doesn't make sense that all these other fixers would immediately reach out to V for help. Not to mention that they all act like she's some sort of celebrity now. Like, the heist was a spectacular failure, but you seem to get praised for it afterwards. It makes no sense in conjunction with the plot. It makes even less sense when it's referenced by other characters as a failure at the same time. Takamura lets you know multiple times how stupid it was to try and steal directly from Arasaka. Not long after that failed heist, you'll run into Rogue, who's supposed to be the top fixer in all of Night City. She even says something along those exact same lines too, and also mentions how many people V shot up during the escape, and that it wasn't just her crew that died as well. V is a relatively new mercenary, and then becomes known citywide for these events. Why would smaller time fixers even risk it, let alone specifically seek her out after she's pissed off the most powerful people in Night City? Dexter tries to kill V and skip town because he can't risk getting caught, Rogue is more than a little skeptical at first, and a man that Arasaka also double-crossed in Takamura 
all see the red flags of V's situation. But all the other fixers can't wait to work with you while also telling you how great you are at your job. Like, how the hell does that make sense in the grand scheme of things? Besides the whole logic of the situation, after the failed heist, V is known as a wanted criminal and merc in the city. We became a wanted criminal not by just killing other wannabe gangsters, but by robbing one of the strongest corporations in the world that has its own military at its disposal. You know, the one that we keep hearing is so all-powerful in the city. The one that we just shot up on our way out. If some random small-time fixer can just pop in on V's Microsoft Teams brain meeting, how the hell has Arasaka not done so yet to locate her? V is extremely trusting of these random people who call her, and she even has to ask who's this every time. I might have missed something, but I don't remember a single one of these going south. If you had to keep this cell phone dependence, they should have added a few jobs that turned out to be setups V walks into. Be it by police, Tiger Claws, Arasaka, Maelstrom, Voodoo Boys, just someone that we've made enemies with over the course of the game, because that turns into a pretty big list of people that we've pissed off. Outside of the main plot points of the Relic and Failed Heist, V basically never faces any other repercussions for any of the player's actions throughout the entire game. The second the mission is over, it's all forgotten about. If I'm remembering things right, I found exactly one side mission where V walks into a trap. It's when you give that shady dude 20 grand for a brain dance. It's disappointing because it's clear as day you're walking into a stupid situation, but whatever, I wanted to play the mission, and that seemed like the only way. Even Johnny pops in a couple times to tell you how stupid you are for going along with what a random back alley brain dance salesman says. Why is this the only time during all the optional content that someone tries to set up V? And the one time it happens, it's from a guy that has no connections to her. He's just a random dude that happens to work for scavengers. This is just a problem that a lot of open world games have. Things that happen in the main story and things that happen in the open world just don't seem to make a lot of sense when you tie them together. Cyberpunk is no different. Anyway, back on topic of the cell phone ruining exploration. Half of Regina's cyber psycho list could have been an unknown location that didn't trigger until you showed up in the area. Imagine if you just stumble upon the ritual killings and girl with the fire mantis blades on your own. You can take her out and then have to check in with Regina afterwards to report a cyber psycho that the player found. Instead of her just giving generic messages and calls that you skip right through, she can show a little emotion and say something like, this was a bad situation, I left it off your list on purpose, glad you made it out alive. Nope, constant calls and texts that just tell you where to go and what to do without any thought process or exploration. If you do just wander into an area with a cyber psycho mission, then Regina will still call to let you know you're close to one anyway, ruining what could have been a surprise encounter. Jesus Christ, when you hang up the phone, whoever you were just talking to will immediately send you texts saying the exact same thing that you just listened to them talking about. You just told me the mission, my little bullet points on the right side updated, why do you need to text me the same information, why is this repeat process necessary, and why does it happen every fucking time? You can't just ignore these because sometimes there are texts that you need to open and reply to in order to further missions. If you ignore all these repeated texts, then your options menu is loaded with 80 new messages from 15 different characters, and that's really annoying to sift through when you're looking for that one random person you need to respond to in order to progress a mission. Not to mention, it just bothers the shit out of me seeing 34 unopened messages sitting in the bottom corner of my screen if I do try and ignore them. I just don't get any of it. What's the point of putting so much clear effort into designing an awesome open world if you very rarely use it in its actual gameplay and just rely on a cell phone that tells you where to go and what to do 100% of the time. For me, this was honestly way more frustrating than any of the glitches. I really liked the setting of Night City. I wanted to explore other than just looking at things, but for some stupid reason, the game fights you and forcibly takes that desire away over time. It's almost like Cyberpunk is open world in theory, but not practice because you're essentially on set tracks the entire game. Yes, you can do things at your own pace, and yes, you can run around freely whenever you want, but you are never going to truly find anything from your own exploration. 
as close as the game manages to get to open world encounters are the NCPD scanner missions. But those aren't really missions, it's just adding a couple more enemies to those attack the NPC with a yellow arrow over their head groups. People give Rockstar a lot of shit now for taking a more linear route in their open worlds, pretty sure I did in my Red Dead videos too, but Cyberpunk is way more egregious of this in my opinion. I don't think I stumbled upon anything of meaning at random. There were a handful of times when I thought that I did, but then I'd get a mission completed update for something I didn't even know was currently an open mission. Quick example, I found this sweet car in the middle of the Badlands and it felt awesome to stumble upon. It's the Calburn. It's fast as hell and modeled after a real life Bugatti. I was using the mountain path as a shortcut to get back and finish another Nomad quest when I came across it. At first, it felt great. Like, oh shit, there really is stuff you can just find in the open world, and it took me this long to run across something. Maybe I do need to keep looking around more often. Then I get in the car and get a pop-up about a mission being completed. Since this was still on the PS4 at the time, at first I thought this was just another glitch. Then I had the very disappointing realization that finding this car was just another undiscovered location style mission I hadn't clicked on yet. It's such a letdown thinking you found a unique secret to only realize it's just another standard mission marker I could have randomly opened at any point. There's no reason for finding that car to technically be a mission, and it's not the only example. There's a handful of gigs that are nothing but V talking to people. Why is it a mission when V just intimidates other street kids harassing civilians? This should be an open world event you can stumble upon. Does this need to have an actual mission marker when just traveling there will take longer than the quote unquote mission will? Reward me with that little scene for going into the shop on my own accord and interacting with a shop owner that I didn't need to talk to. Everything that wasn't just fighting a group of gang members for 30 seconds was 100% completely scripted. A little more freedom and reason to explore Night City on your own would have done this game wonders. The over-reliance of V's cell phone constantly going off and telling you exactly what to do just seems to be the developers shooting themselves in the foot. I wouldn't want the entire game to just be wandering aimlessly, but let me find something, anything, on my own. There's no balance at all between player exploration and scripted missions, and the cell phone mechanic is mostly to blame for this. Now, I really didn't like the way that players are introduced to the side content, but there is a huge saving grace here. Most of that side content is really good. I think that's why I got so frustrated with how this part of the game is presented to the player. All of the optional content is a great complement to the main quest line, and these are a pretty diverse set of missions too. You get the good old fashioned, go here, kill everybody, maybe save some while you're at it, style missions you'd expect, but you also get fun little segments that just further build the lore of the world and have no combat. The main story is always a game's bread and butter, but Cyberpunk's side content is really well done and can influence the ending that you get. There's only so much you can say about the expected, shoot 'em up style kind of missions. If you've played anything that's mission based in the last 20 to 25 years, you've done this countless times. It's just offering more gameplay opportunities, and that's a good thing with Cyberpunk. I have seen some people shitting on the combat, but I didn't mind it. It's definitely not as deep as they advertised, but I liked it. I'll get into that in the next section though. I really enjoyed the variation of the side quests. In the world of Cyberpunk, the human body and life itself is completely undervalued. People come and go, and it doesn't seem like many stick around long enough to grow old. Everyone is kind of a dick to each other, and things that are seen in the real world as sensitive or embarrassing subjects are commonplace in Night City as a result of this live it up while you can mindset. People scrounge up any money they can for physical pleasures and short term satisfactions, yet aren't ashamed to admit it. The best example I can give is running into a man who had faulty cybernetics implanted into his dick. It's quick, it's clearly just a for fun, change of pace gag mission. Hell, at one point the guy is screaming in pain while you drive him to a ripper dock and the game decides to throw a line of kids crossing the street and later on police blocking V's route. It's dumb stuff to play up the comedy of an intentionally dumb mission. But it's not dumb for the sake of just being an attempt at humor. With the lore and themes the game follows, it makes perfect sense that some guy would want to improve his dick and not see any reason to think that's weird. After the painful experience, he even tells V that next time he'll get a more expensive and reliable model, while she can't understand why he'd even risk going through that again. Oddly enough to say, this mission doesn't feel out of place. 
it still gives you a better insight into the way people think and act in Night City. Something this stupid helps build up the lore and setting. Making a 5 minute dick joke not only fit into the lore of your world, but actually expand upon it a little bit, is not an easy thing to do. Then there's the Delamain quests. It has jokes where the AI isn't working right and is terrified of flamingo yard decorations, and it has some cars pondering the meaning of their life and self-worth while they all share the desire to live free. Even if they're just cars, they are sentient, free-thinking beings. If you want to go all the way to the serious side, you can spend the day with a convicted murderer who chooses to record his own crucifixion into a brain dance as his way of repenting. You can spend the day with a guy and then literally crucify him in front of a paying audience. That happens. If that's not your forte, then you can go fight some of those cyber psychos for mini boss fights. You have to go out of your way to learn it, but each one of those also comes with a quick backstory as to why they might have gone nuts too. Besides the one-offs, you even get stuff like Pan Am's whole side story, which I thought was some of the best optional content. It's thought out and paced well, there's conflict and resolution, even Saul gets character development and you can understand his thinking, even though he gets like 5 minutes of screen time. Pan Am's side missions in the Nomad questline felt like I was playing something that was 100% mandatory, but was completely optional. You even get a little spin-off mission with Mitch, where he asks you to help him load his dead friend's body into a truck and drive it off a cliff, because that's the funeral he wanted. It sounds ridiculous on the surface, but you end the quest seeing a difference in ideology between nomads and regular Night City residents. That's how the nomads choose to do it, as opposed to where you give Jackie a more traditional funeral. There are some duds here and there that are kind of boring, but even those usually still expand upon the lore. First one that comes to mind is doing your detective work with the cop Rivers. These are mostly slow, dialogue heavy missions while also doing a few brain dances, a mechanic that I wasn't a huge fan of and thought was just kind of tedious, but it does show that there are both good and bad cops in Night City. Rivers still holds pride in his job and takes trying to help people very seriously. He doesn't want to let Night City corrupt himself and he seems like one of the few generally good guys in the city. While I thought it was kind of boring and these missions weren't my cup of tea, they still add depth to the world. On the other side, you have a whole side story that revolves around V getting Johnny's old band back together to give them one last show and let Johnny reunite with Carrie. I could be misremembering parts, but I feel like there was no combat at all in these missions, but I did enjoy those. You also get a couple missions with Rogue that feel like they should be in the main story, considering V and Johnny discuss it after a mandatory mission. Basically, there's a ton of really good optional content that has a lot of variance in its presentation. When you have close to 100 different side quests, you're going to get some that don't land with every player, but for the most part, they're all pretty good and worth doing. You can make a strong argument that the side content and running around Night City is better than the actual main story missions. It's such a shame that Cyberpunk fumbled its development so badly because the optional content here could have been remembered alongside games like The Witcher 3, Red Dead 2, Skyrim, and so on, if it was able to be properly developed. I think it's that good. Like everything else with this game, here comes the but though. There are some noticeable downsides that hold it back. I just talked about how the game holds your hand through overly scripted missions, but there's also times where it's very unclear how they expect you to complete said missions. Here's a couple examples. The one on screen now is a side job for Rogue. When you get to the warehouse, she flat out talks about using brute force and says how this guy needs to get taken out because he's ruining the whole neighborhood. When the mission starts, your instructions are just get inside the building and then find the target. I fully expected this to mean using brute force. You know, like Rogue told us to do. When you find him, it just says neutralize Vic Varga, then tells you to leave the building to finish up the mission. When I get the usual end of mission call, Rogue starts bitching at me for not being sneaky about it and talks about how much those people have already suffered. Her intro text message says how Vic and his guys are terrorizing people and need to be stopped. Her pre-mission call says brute force is warranted. When I do that, the game then chastises me for it. Her post-mission call says I shouldn't have used brute force. What the fuck, game? You do have the freedom of being sneaky or going in guns blazing on basically every mission. But come on, don't flat out tell me to attempt one method and then yell at me when I do it that way. On the opposite side, there's a mission from Captain Reyes where you're supposed to rescue a woman from a mental hospital. I went into this one trying to be sneaky 
and it worked. I got to the lady and went back out the way I snuck in. I went to lead her around the back of the building, thinking I was being smart, by avoiding the guards, only to have the mission abruptly end. The mission detail just says, escort her out of the building, but what it really meant was, escort her out of the building, the way we never instructed you to go, but wanted you to go anyway. Which is directly through all the guards and hostile NPCs. Sure, again, I completed the mission either way, but if you're going to give me multiple options on how to play it, why actively have the game bitch at me for doing it the way that I wanted? It just doesn't make sense. The exact opposite happens during a Pan Am mission where you have to rescue Saul. This mission couldn't have gone more differently between my first and second playthroughs. My first time, I did this one pretty early on, so I didn't have the necessary skill points to sneak in and get him, then fighting my way in was actually pretty tough. I just wasn't a high enough level yet. A handful of the guards were taking entire 100 bullet defender clips and still standing. This time around, I've done all the side content I've been able to, and my character is a much higher level, so now I've got more than enough for the required body and tech points to get Saul the sneaky way. Doing that, I skipped the entire mission. No big escape, no shootouts, no car chases, no sandstorm. Just get him, get out. It was over in like two minutes. It took longer to watch the surveillance scene that Pan Am sets up than it did to play the actual whole mission. The side instructions tell you to leave through the tunnel again, but then the mission marker and yellow way path are still telling me to go back through the main building and initiate all that combat for no reason. Well, I went the easy way and didn't follow the game's yellow marker out. Then Pan Am says perfect for finding an easier, sneakier route, despite not following the game's marker. In the Reyes mission I brought up, the game just ends the mission abruptly and then tells me I'm doing it wrong because I didn't follow the yellow marker. Like, god damn it, let me get a little consistency is all I want. There's also a handful of times where the mission locations overlap and the game doesn't know what to prioritize. On screen, I get done fighting Rhino in the boxing match, and she tells me she'll let everyone know that I'm cool and that I have access to the whole building now. Well, that's not true at all, because if you go upstairs, you'll enter a hostile area and get attacked. This is because there's an NPC on the second floor that has a separate side gig where you need to take him out. The game can't tell the difference between missions, and will even bring back Rhino's health bar again because the whole gym goes into attack mode right after the game tells you it's safe. My first playthrough, I killed Rhino in the scuffle when everyone attacked, but then she still showed up as a spectator for the final boxing match somehow. To wrap this section up, here's one of Regina's missions, and this whole thing is an absolute mess. During the initial phone call to start the job, Regina's audio cuts out. It gets back on track, but there's also no pathway given in the minimap now. If this had to glitch out, at least here I know that I'm going to the hotel, but the issue is, it directly says not to raise an alarm. What makes this a pain in the ass is three gang members are standing right outside the hotel. Turns out, these gang members aren't part of the mission, it's just bad luck on the RNG that the game spawned them right in front of where I was going. But on the plus side, that means I can walk right past them without immediately failing the stealth side of the mission. I walk in and, force a habit, grab the shard off the desk because shards are fucking everywhere in this game. Literally hundreds of them are lying all around Night City and the player will grab them without a second thought. Well, picking up this shard in particular causes them to attack me and what happens afterwards makes no sense at all. I back off for a second, but realizing my cover is already blown, I go back in to start taking guys out, but then they all start fighting each other instead of me. One of the hotel's guards clearly opens fire on the hotel receptionist. When I turn back around, the tiger claws that had spawned outside the building before the mission are now in the hotel lobby fighting the hotel guards for some reason. They only start to attack me when the hotel guards are taken out. A minute later, when I'm looting weapons and items, the wall camera has an extremely delayed reaction and spots me after I've already been standing in front of it and shooting people for a while. When the camera alert goes off, the game spawns in another enemy outside the hotel, who I catch a very quick glimpse of as they're just running away from the building, never to be seen in the rest of the mission. Again, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter in terms of actually finishing the tasks. 
Very few, if any, have concrete rules that you can't break and will cause a mission failure. That's just the end goal, though. In terms of getting to that end goal, there's a ton of times where Cyberpunk's mission structure is just really inconsistent or flat out poorly designed. CD Projekt Red is lucky that the gameplay is really fun, or these design flaws could have been a much more highlighted problem. And these are problems that you can't blame on the glitches and bugs. This is stuff that technically works and runs fine, but is clearly not programmed or optimized well. All these inconsistencies are the result of the game being rushed out the door too early. It's a shame because I don't think stuff like this can or will ever get corrected. This isn't issues like VT posing on cars, game crashes, scripted events not triggering, cars falling from the sky, or bad texture pop-in. This is the meat of the game and actual mission design that's not polished. They're still working on making sure the game simply runs well, so I can't imagine them having the resources to fix inconsistent design flaws like all these examples that I just gave. It's almost a double-edged sword. Because the game was so broken, things like this seemed to get a pass. But when you really take a closer look at it, now that the game works, there's still a lot of content in Cyberpunk that's very clearly unfinished. Like I said a couple minutes ago, it's such a shame because things like this are really holding back what could have been a great game. But the combat is pretty damn fun. You can genuinely play this game however you want. One thing Cyberpunk nailed was V's customization. For me, I'm terrible at first person shooters, so I went with a straight heavy build on my first playthrough, but did try out a bit more variants since the PS5 allowed it on my second go around. There really are a ton of options here. All the typical FPS guns make an appearance. You've got handguns, shotguns, light machine guns, snipers, and marksman rifles. Each gun has multiple types with different clip sizes and fire rates. You've also got smart weapons, which have lower damage output, but basically do the aiming for you, tech weapons that can charge up blasts to shoot through cover, power weapons that can perform ricochet shots, along with a whole litany of different melee and hand-to-hand -hand weapons. Some of which can be directly implanted into V's arms, like the Mantis Blades or Gorilla Arms. Not to mention all the different hacking and stealth mechanics that can be leveled up as you gain experience. In the beginning, turning off a single security camera will take up a chunk of your resources, but later on, you'll be able to essentially fry a dude's brain from a football field away. There really is a playstyle for everyone, and you can mesh them together pretty well. There is a lot to mess around with, and you don't need to limit yourself to just one or two skills. If you do focus on those two skills you're able to max out, you can make V game-breakingly strong without much effort. Now, again, I'm terrible at first-person shooters. I really don't play them that often, and back when me and my friends did Warzone squads a lot, I never really got that much better at the game, and my role was usually to be the meat shield with an RPG, or the guy that distracted another group we ran into. Cyberpunk is really good for people in that same boat. If you're good at or have more experience with first-person shooters, I'd say put the difficulty up to hard, since normal won't be any challenge for you. And I know that because, for me, normal was a very manageable difficulty. Across two playthroughs, I didn't have many deaths, but when I did, it was always from me just standing in one place for too long during combat, or going after enemies that were a much higher level than I currently was. Once I leveled up and did a bunch of the side quests, I really didn't have to worry too much about being flatlined. The first time I finished the game, I was at level 33, and I felt like I was using a game shark for the second half of the story. My second run where I completed just about every mission the game has, I even handicapped myself and left 30-some perk points unused because I was already cutting through enemies like nothing. But I'm also someone who doesn't really care how good or bad I am at a game, as long as I'm having fun with it. If you're someone who enjoys more of a challenge, or likes to actively get better during a playthrough, yeah, then definitely go with a higher difficulty. Because I'm really bad at shooters, I went with the equivalent of a tank build my first playthrough. Tried to get any perks that increased my hit points and damage reduction, used a lot of shotguns and katanas because I don't have to worry about aiming a whole lot that way, then kept a machine gun for when I did need longer range stuff. That's usually my playstyle with most games. I tend to get impatient with stealth and slower mechanics. I'd much rather just run in like an idiot and see what happens. Because of this, I barely put any levels into hacking or stealth stats. For me, stealth was extremely inconsistent. Not even just from the AI standpoint, but it seemed like the second I got close enough to do a stealth takedown was the second the enemy always turned around. It happens here and there, that's just bad timing. When it happens more than like half the time, that's not a coincidence. 
They either somehow immediately knew I was in the area and put up the caution surveillance mode, or I could walk right past NPCs without them batting an eye. My first playthrough was on the PS4, so I assumed it was just another thing that didn't work. A big part of the reason I went with a close combat build was because the game ran so poorly on the PS4 that this was just the most optimal way of playing. I kinda chalked the poor stealth mechanics and inconsistent AI up to just being the shitty PS4 version. It's kinda not. It's much better on the PS5, but that's not saying much. Sometimes the enemies are laughably stupid, and other times they break off from their patrol routes and run around saying, I know she's here somewhere, even though I haven't been detected or downed any guards yet. So, I had a much bigger section about the stealth mechanics and quick hacks prepared, but now that I'm actually making the video, it just feels like beating a dead horse. It seems like the consensus online is that stealth in cyberpunk just isn't good. At least the other stuff I've brought up, I have concrete examples of to back up my thinking. This was just showing bad AI for too long, so I'm skipping over it. It's a bummer because there's a lot of really good, unique ideas in Cyberpunk for how to play V as a sneaky tech assassin that were just implemented poorly because of bad enemy AI. Gotta say, I was okay with that though. Running Gun in Cyberpunk is really fun, and it's more my personal preference anyway. And I did find it a lot easier to just fire without actually aiming. As long as you have a weapon drawn, you always have a crosshair on the screen. You don't need to make V physically look down the sights to fire. For whatever reason, this worked way better for me than trying to shoot from the normal, aiming down the sights position. My weapons of choice didn't change a whole lot. I always had a shotgun since my accuracy stinks, always had a defender because the clip is massive, and always had a melee weapon because they're just fun to use. On PS4, the non-lethal weapons were broken and always killed people regardless, so I played with katanas all game. PS5, that bug got fixed, so I usually had something blunt or eventually switched to the gorilla arms. The gunplay doesn't really do anything all that innovative, but it's still very fun. The weapon types I mentioned earlier like ricochets and smart weapons are gimmicky and probably won't be your long-term choices, but they are fun to screw around with and break up the gameplay. As I mentioned before, it is really easy to make V overpowered though, specifically with a melee build. If you want to break the game, purchase any of her arm implants. Mantis Blades, Mono Wire, Gorilla Arms, they all have laughably high damage with just their base stats. This can get further boosted, even at low levels, with the right perks. I purposely didn't put any buffs into melee damage because I was dropping almost every enemy in 3 or 4 normal punches. At the same time, I definitely ran around charging up strong attacks with the Gorilla Arms and literally punching people's heads clean off because it's just silly and entertaining. There's one thing that makes the melee builds really overpowered too. Enemies stagger frequently, while V rarely ever does. Technically this works with guns too, specifically shotguns, but it's most noticeable with physical attacks. Just watch the clips on screen as an example. I'm not doing a ton of damage, but I've got the enemies trapped in a stun lock, and it's really easy to do this. On the other side, I don't remember enemies ever really having the same capabilities against V. In most games, it's the exact opposite. Enemies get the advantage of tanking hits while the player gets knocked off balance or staggered from damn near every hit. Not Cyberpunk. V is a goddamn tank, and enemies are the ones who get ragdolled. As a result, there's a ton of melee gameplay options here that I completely forgot about and never touched. If I was on a tougher difficulty, I'm sure they would have been more necessary, but on normal, just hack and slash away. They have sidesteps and dodges, a whole parry system, strong attacks to break defenses and do extra stun damage, along with blocks and counters. These all have perks to boost their effectiveness and give you timed stat bonuses too. Well, I didn't use a single one of them. I was way more efficient just running up and mashing quick attack over and over, or being patient with heavy attacks to stunlock them. This also works with guns, stealth, grenades, and hacking too. You can use perks to significantly boost the damage output of whatever weapons you're specializing in. It seems like the gameplay was balanced around mostly the main story missions. Problem is, there's only like 25 to 30 mandatory missions, but there's around 100 optional ones. If you do as little as 20% of the side content, you will notice the main missions get substantially easier when V has those extra levels. Oh, and I also forgot about weapon and armor mods pretty quickly too. Once they're slotted in, that's where they are. Because you constantly find better weapons and armor, I never really slotted any in because I was still a decent level away from getting the perk that lets you dismantle them and regain the mod. After a few hours and a few more level ups, I forgot mods were even a thing. By the time I remembered, I never used them because I didn't need to. 
A lot of my weapons were already taking people down no problem on their own. Mods can help if you use them, but it's not important to do so. The only ones that really seem to be worth anything are the ones that add armor bonuses. Which leads me into the crafting system. It stinks. There's no way around it. The crafting kinda sucks. It's tedious, it seems to level really slowly compared to the other stats, and by the time you get good enough parts and perks to make good weapons and armor, you've very likely already gotten much better ones through normal encounter drops. Not to mention, you'll start lagging behind on upgrading those same weapons when you can't find enough top tier components. For me, it was just way more beneficial to find high DPS weapons that were just common or uncommon because they cost significantly less to upgrade, which let me keep using them for longer than the higher grade weapons. At lower levels and early stages of the game, this is a huge advantage. I could make an upgraded common weapon way stronger than an epic one because I found myself running out of higher level crafting components pretty regularly. But it wasn't long before I had over a couple thousand uncommon components sitting around. What makes a weapon common or legendary doesn't even have anything to do with its damage. It's all about how many mods you can attach, but most of the mods don't really make that much of a difference. Base damage felt way more important than mod slots, and you will get better weapon and armor drops very, very frequently throughout your game. Cyberpunk is basically a looter shooter. Unless you get a wildly overpowered piece of gear early on, you're going to be switching out weapons and armor constantly. You have two options with this. You can either sell those items or dismantle them. It's a lot faster to just sell the gear and then buy all your upgrade components, but this also means you need to craft a bunch of items you probably won't use to get the crafting experience you're missing out on by not dismantling all your looted items. You're kinda damned if you do, damned if you don't. For me, the only times crafting weapons and armor became useful is when your stats are leveled up a ton. At this point, then you can craft your own legendary items that are extremely powerful later game items. Until you get to those levels, almost everything you randomly pick up after a fight is just as strong or way stronger than what you can craft. I won't say crafting is pointless like a lot of the internet has decided, but it's definitely more of a middle to later game mechanic than something you can take advantage of the whole time. Another thing that's kind of a bummer is when you upgrade and craft items, you're not able to customize them either. You're just clicking stuff to get a higher DPS stat. It's a little weird where the priorities were in terms of aesthetics. I can decide how much dick hair V has, but can't put a decal on a gun that I crafted. I can choose if V still has foreskin hiding under that jungle of dick hair, but can't change the color of my cars. Just as a comparison, that's how much effort they put into crafting and customization. Some of it's a head scratcher. It benefits making V even more overpowered in the mid to late game, but it's far from a great mechanic. As far as the gameplay goes, Cyberpunk is a mixed bag. Just like every other aspect so far, for every positive, there seems to also be a missed opportunity. It's got flaws that are impossible to overlook if I'm being unbiased. But I feel like the positives outweigh the negatives by a pretty good margin here for one simple reason. Cyberpunk is just really fun to play, and I can't even exactly put my finger on why I feel that way. Driving around is fun, gunplay is fun, melee attacks are fun, and Night City is a great setting. The game runs infinitely better than it used to, but you'll definitely still get some issues from time to time. Normally this is a bad thing, but with Cyberpunk, I feel like it gives the game an awkward, charming quality. It's just kinda funny when you call for your car and it says fuck you and keeps driving away. This dude who keeps asking to talk to V while we both clip through NPCs. Once in a while, cars will drop from the sky, or V will use the man's voice even though I was playing as a girl. And sometimes flaming cars that have NPCs stuck in them will just slowly roll around in the breeze. Hell, I even had a time where I thought, hmm, game hasn't crashed in quite a while. I'm probably due. I should manually save. The game froze exactly a minute later. In the beginning of this video, I said I was going to have to point out a lot of bad stuff in the game, but I have also played enough cyberpunk that I could literally tell when the game was about to crash just off of gut feeling. I promise, I do actually love this game. I don't know, after everything that cyberpunk has gone through, I feel like the glitches and shitty performance adds a certain character to it. It's part of the charm that makes the game memorable. When a game doesn't work every now and then, it's frustrating. When cyberpunk almost never worked, it's kind of endearing. You know what you're getting into, and that in turn can make some of its glitches and bugs funny instead of annoying. I really wish I still had my original capture footage from the PS4 version, because this whole video could have been an hour of stupid glitches. There were still issues on the PS5, but it was much less and usually didn't screw up stuff too much. Playing on the PS4, 
I never had any clue what was going to happen next. In a weird way, I kind of missed that. Since the game was somewhat playable, all the glitches kind of became their own game mechanic to work around. In hindsight, the glitches were kind of fun, and I feel like that wackiness gave me a more enjoyable experience somehow. I don't know, I think Cyberpunk just has that it factor. Nobody can describe what it is, but you know it when you see it. Despite everything I've talked about that's been poorly designed or unfinished, I still love this game. With all that out of the way, let's get into the story for a little bit, and there will be spoilers from here on out. I'm torn over Act 1. I don't think it's as bad as people have made it out to be, but it just feels very rushed. Er, well, the initial life paths, they're as bad as people say. Not even bad, really, they just don't matter. Cyberpunk tells some really good stories, but pacing can definitely be a problem at times throughout the narrative. I get the vibe that they had to cut content here. Whether it's because of how poorly the game was running, or they just couldn't fit it all in by the release date, Act 1 feels like it should have been at least a couple hours longer. As I'm sure most people are aware of by now, like I just said, the life path you choose really doesn't matter. I tried all of them over my failed initial playthroughs when the game was still broken, and I thought Corpo was the most boring, where Street Kid and Nomad were kinda interchangeable, even though Nomad has the most gameplay. Street Kid feels weird when you and Jackie are both associated with Padre, grew up in the same area, and are only 2-3 to three years apart in age, but somehow have no idea who each other are. Corpo throws a ton of information at you that's kinda just confusing for a new player, so I would say Nomad is the best from an introductory standpoint. You get dialogue options for each backstory that V can use throughout the game, but they don't really matter in the long run either. For my first successful playthrough, I went with Nomad. Usually V's unique dialogue options were all something along the lines of, Hey, did you know I was a Nomad once? Or, Nomad stick together, you know? And then the conversation just goes on like normal anyway. But it would be kinda weird when V talks about how Nomads are a family when she openly left her Nomad gang behind, but all the Pan Am stuff is then about working out your Nomad family issues. For this PS5 playthrough, I was a street kid, and I can't even tell you what the dialogues changed. It was always some generic, tough guy answer. Usually it just amounted to V getting kinda mad, or making some type of threat, which is already like half of V's regular dialogue. They really offer nothing extra to character interactions the majority of the time. At about the halfway point of both games, I didn't even bother clicking on them anymore. If you really want to roleplay V, these backstories can matter, but other than that, pick whichever. I feel like Street Kid was the quickest, so I'd say pick that one. But if you want to make V overly smug or more of an asshole, I'd say go with Corpo. Street Kid probably lines up best with the actual plot, but there are endings and missions that definitely sync up more with Nomad too. You can get any ending from any backstory though. I hate to say it, but these life path choices probably shouldn't have even been included. I get the feeling that if branching life paths were never openly promised in the marketing material, then these would have been cut out altogether. Another reason why these backgrounds don't matter is because they are just that. Backgrounds. We aren't picking who V is, because V is currently a mercenary working with T-Bug and Jackie. That's not anything the player can change. What we are doing is picking who V used to be, and who they used to be has no bearing on the narrative, ending, or character development at all. These life paths don't even function as tutorial levels, because you'll just get all those through your first mission with Jackie, and optional training from T-Bug's Shard. It doesn't matter whether V used to be a corpo, a nomad, or a street kid, because present day V is a mercenary whose current life doesn't reference any of those previous skills in any meaningful way. Seeing as how you get to distribute your initial stats, I feel like a very easy solution to add a little meaning to these life paths would be to have them associated with which stats are highest. Starting as a corpo could be a higher intelligence build, nomad could be body, and let's give street kid the cool stat cause fuck it. At least this way it would give a little meaning behind the life path. Honestly, I'm surprised they haven't added an option of skipping this introduction altogether in the latest patches. Either way, you'll meet up with Jackie and get a montage of your steady rise in the crime world slash mercenary work of Night City. The main story is relatively short in Cyberpunk. Getting this montage over acting out missions with Jackie is a big mistake in my opinion. I would have liked to play this stuff and Jackie is a good character too. 
I think seeing, and more importantly, experiencing, him and V get all buddy-buddy together would have definitely helped the plot. I know Jackie's character is a happy-go-lucky guy, but you know him for like 10 minutes, and he basically just blurts out how you're best friends now. It kind of reminds me of the did-we-just-become-best-friends scene from Step Brothers. Oddly enough, with Corpo, you're already friends, which never really gets explained how, but then the montage hits, and you can't help but feel like you're already missing pieces of the narrative. It also then feels disjointed when you're only an hour in and you're meeting up with a big-time fixer in Dexter Deshaun, who was another character I would have liked to have seen more of. The dude's known as one of the top players in Night City, but with the rushed intro, it doesn't feel earned when you get a meeting and job opportunities with him. It just feels weird when right away the game starts with V being a nobody, then after a Rocky-style montage, you've got the chance of a lifetime to move up in the city ranks. Jackie talks about how this is such a big deal, but you as the player have no reason to think the same thing too, because we barely know anything about the game yet, let alone its characters. The montage makes it feel like a couple hours of gameplay went missing. I know that's exactly the point of a montage, but it makes sense to do in movies because you can't dedicate the extra screen time to these events. Games, on the other hand, do have that luxury of expanding upon characters for hours at a time. While the story is relatively short, you can easily spend 50 to 100 hours in Night City if you're going for full completion. What's another two or three to expand on the beginning? This is why I feel like they were probably forced to cut content from the intro. Anyway, you do exactly one mission for Dexter, and all of a sudden you're just his best buddies and the two people he selects for a heist on Arasaka Tower. In between this, you meet Evelyn, who wants you to take her side and leave Dexter out of the cut. I don't know or care who Evelyn is. I barely even know who Dexter is, but I at least know he's a big name in the underbelly of Night City. Who's Evelyn and why should I trust her over a dude that we've been warned about not to double cross? Again, like, the beginning just feels so rushed. You're supposed to believe that these characters are important, but we never see why or get any reasoning other than just being told, hey, these characters are a big deal. Not to mention that there's a lot more of Evelyn that we'll see and do missions around later in the game, yet you never get to know her and it's more about Judy. What I do know is, I wanted to work with gangster Mark Henry. I felt like it was pretty obvious that he would double-cross us at some point, but I didn't care. He seemed like an interesting character, but he's there and gone in no time. To go along with things being rushed in Act 1, clearly this heist was going to go south. Looking back on it, Act 1 is really just a bit messy overall. Even though the end result is the same, the prior mission where you get the flathead has a ton of different outcomes and character interactions, which gives off the feel that the entire game is going to be like that. It's not. This is kind of the high point of player choice until the ending. It's then followed up by the very slow and tedious introduction to Evelyn, followed by the very predictable failed heist. Jackie is acting a lot different than the rest of the game, and V even points it out on the car ride. You can see from a mile away that he's going to die during this mission. Not to mention that they also showed Jackie's death and Dexter's betrayal years ago in promotional trailers. This could have had a bigger impact, but the whole Arasaka thing and the characters around it just have no build-up whatsoever. I've played the game twice, and I still have no clue what Evelyn's motives were or why she wanted the shard. Something to do with not working at Clouds anymore, I think? It seems a little drastic if she just wanted out of Night City. Hell, the player barely even knows anything about Arasaka at this point in the game either. What happens during the heist is supposed to be a big deal, and they tell us that the one dude is the Emperor, but again... None of that really connects because I'm pretty sure we've never even heard these names before. Unless I missed more than a few things, I had no context as to what I was watching when shit hits the fan. V, T-Bug, and Jackie are freaking out while they're hiding, but the player has no reason to think along those same lines. When they say, what's the Emperor doing here, I didn't know what that meant. Not that I don't know what an Emperor is, but I don't know enough about Night City and this world yet to know its importance. Is that Japan's Emperor? is Night City even in Japan? Now that I think about it, where the hell is Night City even located? If he's the Emperor, does this guy even rule the country I'm in? Is this a Futurama situation, but instead of an Earth President, it's an Earth Emperor? I feel like it resembled more along the lines of America, so does America have a Japanese Emperor? Maybe it's not even a political ruler thing. Maybe they call him the Emperor because he's the head of a Japanese company. Then I realized, shit, I don't know much about the Arasaka company either. Is this a global company, or do they just operate in and control Night City? 
Do they have an actual business but are slowly taking over the world like Shinra? Or is it just straight up power hungry rich people that over time turned the government and military into a privatized thing? If it's the latter of the two, does Arasaka have governing power in wherever I'm at? Then I started thinking about why the penthouse suite that's being reserved for the Emperor's family would have a server tower in the middle of its floor layout, and why would that same server tower have a two-way interrogation mirror style wall inside of it, instead of, you know, just a server room. As all these thoughts of confusion were going through my head, I then realized, shit, I wasn't even paying attention to what the two of them were talking about anymore, but now the old dude was being strangled by his son. Maybe I missed some obvious context clues, but I did not grasp the importance of this scene at first. I even went back and rewatched my gameplay capture and noticed that they mentioned selling something to the Westerners. Okay, so Night City isn't in Japan. Answers one question, but still leaves a hell of a lot more. Like, hey, Cyberpunk, tell me what the fuck is going on at least a little bit before you throw a scene like that out there. I don't need all the information, I love a good slow burn in the plot, but you need to feed me at least a little bit of context clues other than old guy dead equals bad thing for V. If you keep the story told at the same pace, I think it would have been better if V and Jackie didn't fully understand what they were witnessing at the time either, and then Dexter Deshawn had to explain to you what just happened. When I first played this, I did not get the feeling this was going to be a massive plot point going forward. I thought it would be just a segue thing that gets V in some short-term hot water. Clearly the game is now telling you this is a really big deal, but the player has no reason to think it'll be brought up throughout the entire game. V never really sees any repercussion for being involved in the heist either. If anything, it seems like all the blame gets shifted to only Takamura, yet I'm pretty sure Arasaka is very aware that V is alive and has the relic. You can find out more about Yorinobu and that he doesn't really care about V or the relic, but then why does he care about trying to kill Takamura? When those assassins don't return, wouldn't he try to take out V and Takamura again? Apparently not. If Yorinobu felt the need to send assassins after Takamura and make him public enemy number one, I feel like he'd want V dead too just in case. I've seen people defend it by saying he's not worried about the relic, and everyone already knows he's lying about his dad's death, so having V around to give a testimony wouldn't really matter anyway. If that's the case, why did he try and kill Takamura then? When he first finds V, Takamura is clearly still on Arasaka's side. It's not until he gets betrayed by Yorinobu and has his cyberware cut off that Takamura starts asking for V's help. Before they turned on Takamura, he called to say he found V alive and addresses V as Saburo's killer. So Arasaka knows that V's alive and doesn't care, but still cares enough to send assassins out only after Takamura confirms that he's found V. Every fixer in Night City and even some random civilians pop in on V's phone, so it does feel weird when Arasaka never calls up or tries to track her. If they just don't care about V after the heist, why even send Takamura after her in the first place? It's a really cool action scene that leads to important plot advancement, but it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you actually think about why any of it happened that way. Now, I'm not being sarcastic here. I'm sure I'm missing something or interpreting it the wrong way. If it doesn't take writing out a massive comment, I'd love to know the whole reasoning behind it. I have to be missing something. But final note for Act 1, the first act being rushed really hurts two characters specifically. That's Jackie and Dexter. In the grand scheme of things, they both do their jobs from a storytelling standpoint. Jackie is our access point into the mercenary world, and Dexter gets us into Arasaka Tower, which then gets us the construct in V's brain. On the surface, those characters did what the plot needed them to do, so then they became expendable. They serve their purpose, but both of them really feel underutilized though. Hell, I feel like we learn way more about Jackie from the missions around his funeral than we did while he was alive and working with V. Jackie says Dexter is the biggest fixer in Night City, but then says how Rogue runs the city when we get into the afterlife. We hear that Dexter was out of the game for a while and doesn't seem to have the best reputation outside of how Jackie talks about him. A couple more missions that opened up on some of this information could have made a huge difference in the success of Act 1's storytelling. It really begs the question, if the game was in a better state upon release, would they have had time to fix the issues during Act 1? Then this crazy thing started to happen after Act 1. I went from being confused and different and thinking about giving up on the game to getting really invested in it. 
Because Cyberpunk was so buggy at release, I never heard anything about the actual game, and that saved me from ever coming across major spoilers. When Johnny turned out to be a dead rock star and terrorist who was now living in V's head and wanted to kill her, I didn't see that shit coming at all. Keanu Reeves seems to be almost universally loved and has rarely played a straight up bad guy in his films. Them setting up Johnny Silverhand as an antagonist that lives in your head was pretty awesome when I saw his first scenes. As a standalone character, I didn't really care about V at this point in the story. I didn't think there was a ton of personality there, and all we really know about her is she wants to have some sort of legacy in Night City. By herself, V was a little boring. To be fair though, I also had no clue what the hell was going on at this point in the game in general. I've seen a lot of people online shitting on Johnny as a character, but together, I thought the dynamic between him and V was the best part of the game. When they turn into reluctant allies, I decided I wanted to try and make peace with Johnny, and was overly nice to him in all of our conversations. Or at least as nice as the game lets you be. I loved the transition of watching him go from wanting V dead, to then worrying more about her than himself. It's really good character writing most of the time. Whereas Act 1 felt rushed and characters felt underdeveloped, Act 2 started to shine. There's definitely still some plot holes, weird pacing, and questionable means of relaying information to the player, but it usually comes together very nicely. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good storytelling. I even got a little hooked in over V's relationship with Takamura. It's kind of the same setup. Uneasy allies at first, and with the right dialogue options, the two develop an understanding of each other despite being completely different people. If you do the side content, then you get a lot more fleshed out relationships with a ton of other characters too. Whereas Act 1 feels like they probably cut more than a few corners, Act 2 feels like the start of the real game and the developer's true vision of what Cyberpunk was supposed to be. A minute ago, I talked about how I would have liked Jackie and Dexter getting expanded roles, but said they did fulfill their purpose to the story. At first, it kind of feels weird, but as the game goes on, that's kind of just the way Cyberpunk operates. Storytelling doesn't have to be ridiculous and convoluted to achieve its goals. Cyberpunk tells a good story, but it's not one with a lot of twists or depth after we meet Johnny and learn about the Construct. We need to get the Construct out of V before she runs out of time. It's not quite as simple as that, but I feel like this isn't a game that has a ton of deep storytelling or plot points that you can miss, except for a pretty big one with Johnny that I'll get into in a minute. For the most part, if you're paying attention during the main missions, you know the majority of what's going on around the ending. There are subtleties, but for the most part, the narrative is a case of what you see is what you get. You can reduce even the most convoluted of plots down to similar elevator pitches, but there's always stuff that happens along the way to add more elements to the story. With Cyberpunk, we go into some crazy shootouts, dive into a living internet, and meet a wide array of characters, but the goal never changes, and V never really has a say in anything. You can learn a lot more background information on events and characters, but whether you have that information or not doesn't change our character's trajectory or throws a wrench into our plans. At least not until the very end when the player gets to pick how this is handled. It's all on the player to determine how far down the rabbit hole of lore they want to go. With most games, missing out on background lore would be a big detriment. Kinda like me not knowing anything about Arasaka when Saburo was getting choked out. But with the way they set up the rest of the plot after Act 1, you really only need to know what's directly presented to the player to understand what's going on. It doesn't matter if you pick up on things like Rogue working with Arasaka after Johnny's death, if you know who Morgan Blackhand is or not, if you don't understand what the Voodoo Boys want behind the Black Wall. I could give a million of those examples, but those don't really affect V's story. They affect the greater narrative, but not V personally. This is because V is a very reactionary character. It's the things that happen around her that drive the story as opposed to her actions moving the narrative. She's kind of just along for the ride and has to put her trust into people that don't have her best intentions in mind because she has no other options. Oh, probably a way too late side note. I played as girl V, so force of habit, I always refer to V as her. It wasn't like an, ah, look at her tits kind of thing. I just thought male V sounded like a douchebag. So I played as the other one. Anyway... V never has a say in how things play out until the very end, and even then, you can put that choice in Johnny's hands over hers. In terms of V's story, the player's goal and the character's goal are the same. Do what people tell you in order to get the relic out. Even before we're introduced to Johnny, V is stuck doing jobs for her fixers. She's working for them, doing what they want her to do, and after her and Johnny start to blend together, she's still stuck doing what other people tell her is the best way to remove the relic. 
Just like the player doesn't need to know all the lore of Night City, it wouldn't change any of V the character's decisions if she had the same information. She's really kind of a tragic character in that sense. While she shares the same I want to leave a legacy and become a legend mindset that Jackie does, V craves this because she really wants control. She doesn't want to be yet another person who just lives, dies, and is forgotten about. Besides trying to save her life from the construct taking over, Johnny also represents the most literal definition of her fears. This isn't just another situation of her not having control over her own life, but physically losing control of her mind and body to another entity that lives inside her head. When you really think about it, that's something that belongs more in a horror game than an action shooter. V is kind of a unique character in that sense. On the surface, she's a little bland and someone who's at the whim of the situations around her. But the game never tries to hide the small moments where she does open up and become vulnerable. In the scene where V talks to the doll and actually opens up, the game likes to make it seem like V is someone who keeps everything buried deep down and just puts out this tough exterior, but I didn't see it like that. There's tons of lines here and there where she shows her vulnerabilities to people and you don't need to read between the lines to understand them. Whereas on the surface, I initially thought V was a bland character, but the more you piece everything together, her character, Night City's lore, and the game's narrative are all simultaneously working together to tell an awesome story. In modern games, TV, movies, whatever, I feel like the more you think about things, the more they usually start to fall apart a little bit. With Cyberpunk, it actually gets more in-depth the more you look into it, and that was a great surprise. It's a really good balance, and this is highlighted by V's relationship with Johnny. As I just said, V is a reactionary character. In a way, she's kind of a blank slate. While there is a person there that has desires, needs, and fears, a lot of her dialogue is pretty generic. There isn't a whole lot behind her actual personality. By herself, sorry to say, V isn't all that interesting. It's everything all around her and the greater narrative that make her compelling. Johnny Silverhand is very interesting by himself, though. I thought he was the most fascinating character in the narrative by far. Supposedly, during initial development, Johnny was supposed to appear less, but Keanu Reeves' people said, if we're going to do this, we want Johnny to have a larger role in the game, and I think that was a great idea in retrospect. Not that I disliked V or anything, but I feel like her character writing would have struggled a little to carry this narrative mostly by herself. Having more of her and Johnny together was definitely the smarter move. When we first meet him, he's a huge asshole. He's a complete stereotype of the 1980s sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle if you also add being a terrorist in there. Depending on your interactions with him, you'll either become uneasy, forced allies, or develop a genuine understanding of each other. But I found myself asking if that's actually Johnny or not. A big plot point is V potentially blending with Johnny's personality, but I feel like it's much more the other way around. I can't stress how much of an asshole they make Johnny out to be. Charismatic, yes, but also a genuine huge asshole. When he starts to lighten up, I really feel like it's V influencing him. Without going over hours of conversations, I think the best example is when V lets Johnny take over to go see Rogue. Technically, Johnny does what he says, and that's his defense when V gets pissed at him for going on an absolute bender in her body instead of just talking to Rogue. He's enough of an asshole that he doesn't see anything wrong with what he did and even tries to deny that he thought about staying in control when they share a brain and V knows what he was thinking. To him, V should be thanking him that he decided to give her back control, but also accuses her of not trusting him. He's a little kid that only cares about what he wants and only thinks his perspective is right. He constantly pushes his agenda with Arasaka on V and tries to manipulate her thinking into his never-trust-anyone paranoia. When he was physically alive, Johnny didn't give a shit about anyone unless there was some sort of self-gain involved, even though he would claim the opposite. Johnny definitely has a narcissistic personality, but really shows a lot of the warning signs of being a legit psychopath too. When all is taken hostage is a perfect example. Even when she's kidnapped, he can't accept that she's a crazy good netrunner and Arasaka was actually after her the whole time. He still makes it all about himself and tries to rescue all under the pretense that they used her to get at him. He does feel genuine remorse when he believes she's dead, but again, he feels remorse because he believes they did this out of spite against him. Alt's kidnapped and stuck in the internet, but Johnny makes himself the victim in focal point. 
Afterwards, there's no real careful planning or taking a step back. It's just, hey, let's go in guns blazing and drop a nuke on Arasaka. Everything is always about him, and he has no thought process that it isn't. He believes he's fighting this war for the people, but really he's just impulsive, angry at the world, and extremely self-destructive. Alt's kidnapping and murder just gave him a more focused target for those thoughts. However, it does really need to be noted that this is still the world of cyberpunk. If this was the real world, or another game that's more grounded in reality, those personality traits would be seen very differently. In Night City, this kind of personality, anger, and resentment towards corporations is much, much more common. Johnny isn't some Ted Bundy-style psycho, he's just someone that actually puts his plans into action, rather than being a common criminal who just walks the streets and talks a big game. I don't want to make it sound like I think he's completely insane or anything like that. He could still lead a somewhat normal life while playing gigs and forming relationships, even if those relationships were rocky at best. When he first lightens up with V, it's because he realizes that unless the two of them work together, he's dead. Again, it's self-gain, not him trying to be a nice guy and make friends. If you do some side questing, later on Johnny will admit faults and finally show remorse not only towards V, but for a lot of his behavior while he was alive too. But I don't think these are 100% his thoughts. I'm pretty sure this is his brain, slightly melded with V's, and that's the only reason he starts to think somewhat logically. He's still obsessed with killing Adam Smasher though, and even makes this essentially his dying wish. Whether it's in the side quests or later story missions, this Johnny that does start to open up with V isn't completely Johnny. Or at least I don't think. It's Johnny with V's influence. Everyone we meet from Johnny's past thinks of him as a delusional prick, and that's not just a coincidence. If everyone around you thinks you're an asshole, well, you're more than likely an asshole. You could definitely interpret this as Johnny becoming a new man and that he's changed, which technically is true, but it's not by his own accord. It's with the help of V's thoughts. V isn't the greatest person in the world either, so this just goes to show how far off the deep end Johnny was when V is the catalyst for this radical change. Even when Johnny says that he'll leave and go into Mikoshi, I don't take this as Johnny having a true change of heart. I took this as it was V's influence and desire to live rubbing off on Johnny throughout the game, just like we see small influences of Johnny come out in V. V's thoughts cloud his thinking when every time he helped you before, it was for nothing more than self-preservation. If V's body dies, then so does he. I think this is backed up when, in the end, the player can still choose to have Johnny betray V and straight up take her body against her will. Johnny isn't exactly happy about it, but he can still do it. It's his wish to live overriding V's influence, or at least if that's where the player chooses to go. This is definitely one of the game's stronger points, though. It's completely open to interpretation, and you might think that Johnny really has changed by the end. He might not have a physical body anymore, but he does have a living consciousness. It's entirely possible I'm wrong, and he changed for the better on his own. Unless the developers come out and say one or the other, you can make an argument for either side, and I don't think there's a way to solidly say who's right and who's wrong. It's just a matter of opinion and perspective. Whether Johnny turns out to be a misunderstood douchebag that has a hero's turn, or is the same old asshole that doesn't realize he's being influenced by V's thoughts, doesn't change one thing, though. That he's a very entertaining character. I love the back and forth between him and V. It's great storytelling of the enemies becoming friends trope. But there is one very big aspect to Johnny's character that a lot of people might not even realize. He's an unreliable narrator. It doesn't have too much of an impact on the narrative as a whole, so the game never really goes out of its way to inform the player of this. You need to pay attention to detail and do some extra digging to get the whole story. The quick version? Johnny never dropped a nuke on Arasaka. He was there when it happened, but he was just there as another person filling an infiltration squad. If you mention Johnny at the end of the Adam Smasher fight, there's a reason that Smasher appears confused. It's because there was never this big rivalry between the two. Adam Smasher did kill Johnny Silverhand, but it's not quite the same as he remembers. We see Johnny gunned down as he's trying to board a helicopter and escape Arasaka Tower. That never happened. In the scene before this, there's a weird cut in the mission. We see Johnny's on his way to the roof, but gets blown back from a small explosion. We see Adam Smasher arrive while Spider Murphy yells for Johnny to run. This scene and that weird cut is actually where Johnny is killed. That explosion that blew the doors open was just a shotgun blast from Smasher's weapon. That blast also blew a hole right through Johnny. 
if I remember right, actually blew him into two different pieces. Johnny joined the raid as a way to try and free Alt from Makoshi, but found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time when it came to Adam Smasher. The raid was really led by a character named Morgan Blackhand and Militech. Johnny had very little to do with this, and it was Morgan Blackhand that fought Smasher on the roof of the building. This is also why Johnny's gun takes people out in one or two hits, and he has constant health regeneration. Johnny remembers himself as this badass freedom fighter that, in reality, he never really was. What we play as Johnny never happened that way, but it's what the engram of Johnny remembers. It's up for debate why his memories are messed up too. He did basically sit by himself in the construct for 50 years, could just misremember, or he could be kinda crazy since he's on a biochip. Arasaka could have messed with his memories, or it could have been Spider Murphy, who initially set the Soul Killer program on Johnny right before he died. I thought some of Johnny's stories didn't fit together, but initially I had to go online to learn most of this. You can spend dozens of hours in Cyberpunk and completely miss all of this information. Except for Smasher asking what Johnny has to do with anything and one line from Alt hinting at this, I don't think there's anything else that's openly presented to the player about Johnny being an unreliable narrator. This is another place where Cyberpunk shines. For a game that was released completely broken and has clearly had to cut corners during some mission and story beats, there are times that the characters and narrative are written so fucking well. Night City and the world of Cyberpunk is a brutal place. As bad of a person as Johnny is, there are tens of thousands just like him, or worse, in the game. Jackie seems like the polar opposite on the surface. He's a loyal friend, he loves his mother, he treats Misty very well, he works hard to achieve his goals, and seems like an all-around good guy. He chooses to be a mercenary because he wants to make enough money to get out of this cycle and give his loved ones a better life. He has the best intentions in mind. Well, his path to achieve those goals is through stealing, murder, and violence. Having good intentions doesn't change the fact that he's really not a good person either. It's almost like he has a split personality between his regular life and his job. And in Night City, that violent lifestyle is considered a legitimate job. Everyone is just trying to survive, and the whole city learned to take morals out of it a long time ago. The struggle to rise above poverty and have a certain level of comfort is something we see in almost every character we meet. Claire is a very minor character, but her missions revolve around a secret plan to murder the man she believes is responsible for her husband's death. Well, her and her husband also frequently took part in Twisted Metal style races where you openly shoot at other drivers. She's furious over what she believes was a deliberate action against her husband, but doesn't see anything wrong with injuring or killing other drivers herself. Her comfort was taken from her, and that's all that she's worried about. Is this hypocritical? Of course it is. But it also highlights the killer be killed, survival of the fittest mentality of Night City's residents, and how that even spills over into things that are considered leisure activities or hobbies. Johnny's bandmate Carrie achieves massive success with his solo career, but finds no happiness with the fame and money that follows. He's living the life that everyone wants, but in order to achieve and maintain that success, he needs to create soulless music that's only purpose is to appeal to the masses. This depression spills over into his waking life, where he has everything money could buy, except for friendships and a sense of pride in his career that he lost decades ago. Where Carrie struggles with the idea of selling out, Rogue is on the opposite side. She went from a top mercenary in her younger years to then being the top fixer at the start of the game. But it's also implied that she likely sold out and worked with both Arasaka and Adam Smasher on occasion in order to get her top spot in Night City. Judy is a really talented programmer who could work a high paying job, but chooses to make porn in the basement of a bar because a corporation literally destroyed her hometown. Johnny is eventually faced with the reality that instead of being viewed as a freedom fighter, he's viewed as kind of a joke in the current times and sees his corpse unceremoniously just dumped in a random field somewhere. I could list so many more, but you get the point. There's so many examples of characters normalizing their actions as a result of their surroundings or simply being psychologically crushed as a result of Night City's living conditions. For the majority of people, there's no hope to begin with. Takamura sums it up very well. To paraphrase, he says that no one is happy and everyone wants something to fight for, but they never offer any solutions for change. Everyone is so unhappy and the culture is so bad that no one has any idea how to genuinely make life better. All they know is what makes them feel proud or good in the moment before you come crashing back down to reality. Anything to distract them from life and believe that their existence mattered. 
It's fucking grim, but it's really well told most of the time. I'm not an expert on the cyberpunk genre by any means, but cyberpunk the game absolutely nails the often used main theme of hopelessness and self-isolation, despite the litany of technological advances. And God damn it, I wish I could just stay on a positive note for one aspect of this game, but it just won't let me. For as good as the characters are usually written, there's a lot of minor flubs with the dialogue and pacing. The biggest one is between V and Johnny. I guess it can't really be avoided, but depending on your progress in the main story, your relationship together slingshots you back and forth at times. Do a couple side quests, and you're all buddy-buddy, then you do a narrative mission, and the two do nothing but shit talk the whole time. We hate each other's guts in the main narrative, but then let's go do fun, happy stuff like ride a roller coaster together and buy back some samurai merch to make Johnny feel better. It's all but unavoidable in a game this big, but that doesn't mean you won't notice it either. It's a necessary evil with open world games that just drives me nuts. The next examples I'm going to give will seem like nitpicks, which they are, but these small nitpicks add up over the course of a long playthrough to become more and more noticeable as the game goes on. And things like these were avoidable. From what I've seen, the romance options don't switch up anything regarding what gender the player makes V. It's weird when female V and male V are saying the same thing to romance options, but the only thing that changes in the end is whether they eventually bang someone or not. This doesn't stand out like a sore thumb, but when you see both sides, it feels weird. Let's use Pan Am to show what I mean. The game assumes you're going to try and hook up with her, whether V is male or female, so they don't even factor this in at times. I did the opposite on this gameplay capture, and requested different rooms when we get to the hotel. The next morning, Pan Am still has all the same dialogue about V making noises in her sleep, despite the fact that the two characters not only didn't spend the night together, but they also slept in two completely different buildings. The writers didn't even take into consideration that you might not try to hook up with Pan Am here. I definitely noticed them more on my second playthrough, but there's more than a few continuity errors like this. Then there's just pacing issues, and we'll use Judy as the example. Yeah, her and V are getting along better, but it's still mostly about trying to help Evelyn and the dolls. They're friends, but it's mostly work-related. Well, once the actual missions are done, there's a very noticeable shift in their dialogue. They go from friendly co-workers to very openly hitting on each other, all in the beginning of the same sequence. It really feels like there was supposed to be a buffer mission in between. Something that lets the player see the transition of them going from friends to then telling each other how hot they look in scuba suits. Just watch these two quick clips. You killed her? Oh my fucking god. You killed her. Sorry, Judy, I, I didn't plan for it to happen. I know. Give me a sec. I gotta gather my wits. I, uh... I gotta process all this in peace. Alone. Be seeing you, V. See ya, Judy. V? Looking good? You mean, considering the shit we've been through? Well, factor that in and you look fucking amazing. The first one is the end of the final mission with the Myco stuff, and the second one is literally the next time we see Judy. That transition feels very out of place. Like, Judy's thought process was, well, Evelyn is dead, and V just killed my ex. Guess that means me and her have to scissor now. Side quests and character development are usually fantastic, but there are some very noticeable errors from time to time. The main story, on the other hand, there's a few moments where they don't quite stick the landing. Most noticeably for me, a lot of the dialogue is pretty bland. It reminded me of Horizon Zero Dawn a lot. That game also had an awesome story that I wanted to learn more about, but there was this thing with the dialogue that just bugged me as the game went on. About half of it felt necessary, and the other half felt like Aloy and NPCs were just saying random passive-aggressive things to each other. That was a lot of cyberpunk too. I get why it's a thing. In Horizon, Aloy is an outcast who's looked down on, so there's always a chip on her shoulder and doubt in everyone else's minds. In Cyberpunk, Night City is a rough place and everyone is rightfully on guard all the time. Thematically, these frequent, being a bit of a dick to each other for no reason dialogues, make sense. Playing them, 
it kind of makes you roll your eyes and think you've heard V say these same lines 10 times over already. There's a lot of dialogue with V that just sounds copy and paste. It didn't take me too long before I stopped picking the blue conversations because majority of the time, it just didn't offer anything worthwhile. It was more time consuming than anything else and I'd just go right to the yellow advance to conversation options. When you do get different choices to steer the conversations, it always felt like it ended up in the exact same place anyway. Other than a character saying, fuck you, or what would you know about that, to a negative response, before defaulting back to their normal on-rails answer, it just didn't feel like going off script or using the different options that the game provides really changed anything. It's giving the player the illusion of control when the majority of these should be scripted conversations or cutscenes. Unless you're a diehard fan of the game and really looking to get any little nugget of backstory or lore, you're going to skip right to the highlighted yellow advance to conversation topic. This might seem like another small nitpick since you can choose the yellow advance option whenever you want, until you realize how much time the developers wasted on programming, recording, and implementing literally hundreds of extra go-nowhere blue dialogue options that almost always serve nothing new to the narrative or character development. There's times where there's multiple yellow options to advance the conversation, it still seems like the characters end up in the exact same place anyway. Then there's times where you have to sit through these long, drawn-out, recon kind of schematics before you start the mission. Why is Takamura showing me all this stuff when I'm just going to have the mission markers all over the screen tell me what to do? I don't have to remember any of this, but now I have to sit through it. It's all flash and no substance. Not to mention all the times where you'll be forced to slowly walk with NPCs while the current mission objective is just follow so-and-so character. It's wasting the player's time. Once you see how little a lot of this means, just like I talked about with the open world, it gets painfully obvious that this was supposed to be so much more at one point, but the developers started running into all the delays, bugs, and crashes. In the beginning of the game, you have options between Evelyn or Dexter and to go have a meeting with Meredith Stout or not. These don't change the end result, but they do change how the mission and dealing with Maelstrom is played. It changes how the player perceives the game depending on their choices. I feel like they originally intended for most of the character interactions to be formatted this way, but just couldn't pull it off. As a result, you get a ton of filler-like pointless dialogue options and mission schematics that rarely factor into the equation. Let's keep with the trend of this video and get back to the good stuff. End it on a high note. I thought Cyberpunk nailed its endings. Every one of them and their variations makes sense in the scope of the narrative. I'm not going to break down each of them individually because that would add another 15 to 20 minutes onto this video, but each one of them could realistically be considered a canon ending. That's something that's extremely hard to pull off. Cyberpunk definitely has endings that lean towards being labeled the good or the bad endings, but none of them feel used as a way to tell the player they did something wrong. Even the worst ending, where V decides to take herself out, rather than risk anyone else's lives, makes sense in the scope of her character. Regardless of going that route, siding with Arasaka, asking the Autocados for help, or going with Rogue while Johnny takes control, there's one major outcome. That V is still doomed. The damage has already been done. She can extend her life a little bit longer, but at least for the end of the main story, there's no cure for V. Except for one outcome where you decide to hand over your body to Johnny, no one gets a happy ending. Even then, this is a much different Johnny than we see during the game. Despite getting his initial goal, he's not happy about it either. There is a sense of irony in these endings too. As I said earlier, V never gets a say in anything. She wants control of her life and her decisions. After spending the entire game working for other people and doing what everyone else says is her best course of action, at the very end, V finally gets to decide how she wants to handle this. There's a point where the game flat out tells us this. V says she hoped there would have been a chance at a happier ending for everyone, and Johnny replies with, wrong city, wrong people. It's the game reminding us that Night City is undefeated, and Alt follows up with how V has earned the right to decide for herself how everything plays out. One person can't break the cycle. In a sense, everything you did was kind of for nothing. The world is going to move on whether you're in it or not. The only variable in the equation is if people are going to remember V after she's gone. It's bleak as hell, but 
this isn't a game that I would expect a happy ending from. When you strip down the bright lights and weird quirks of the game, this is an extremely grim setting, and the endings further represent that. But we are getting Phantom Liberty in the next few months, so who knows? Maybe V will find a cure if the DLC takes place after the events of the ending. I started this video by saying how weird of a game Cyberpunk is for me. For me, Cyberpunk is one of gaming's biggest what-ifs. What if Cyberpunk was actually finished? What if CD Projekt Red wasn't a publicly traded company and didn't have shareholders or investors to answer to? What if this was a subsidiary of Sony or Microsoft and had that type of financial backing and resources to help with development? What if they were able to come out and just say, hey, we screwed up, it's not ready, and it's not going to be ready for another two years. The PS4 and Xbox One versions, they don't work. You're not getting them anymore. We can only run this on next-gen consoles. We get it, you're mad, and you're losing faith. But when this comes out, you're gonna fucking love it. Like, what if that was an option? The version of Cyberpunk we got was clearly half-baked. If they were able to really work on everything that's presented, I really believe this could have been a generational-type game. The way people remember The Last of Us, Elden Ring, Resident Evil 4, Red Dead Redemption 2, Halo, Final Fantasy 7, Skyrim, Cyberpunk had the potential to be one of those games, but all the patches and DLC in the world are never going to let Cyberpunk live up to its potential. That's such a huge bummer. It's taken a long time, but a lot of people have given Cyberpunk another shot and realized that it's still a pretty damn good game regardless, though. But what if we could have gotten the full version? What if we could have gotten what Cyberpunk was supposed to be? Overall, it's a mixed bag, but I do think the good really outweighs the bad here. There is something that will draw you into Night City and keep you wanting to come back. For me, Cyberpunk just had that it factor. I don't know what it exactly was, but it was enough to make me a big fan despite all its shortcomings. That's all I've got this time around. You guys know all about the like, comment, share, and subscribe stuff that the algorithm loves. Do so if you feel like it. It always helps and lets me know if you like what you've seen. If you watched this video, a huge thank you for doing so, and I do hope you enjoyed it. If you want, check out some of my other videos on here, and uh, yeah, that's all I got for now. See you guys.